I think it's not a big secret <laughs> that this is this subject is on everyone's mind uh, today. Uh, probably the people have watched the news more for this than anything else, especially amongst the brethren to see what's going on. And we know the very difficult circumstances that many of uh, many Jewish friends are going through uh, and things that are happening in our own country with this. So I thought it'd be appropriate to, to talk about whose land is it? And again, this is one man's opinion, remember? And I'm sure some of the things I'll show and perhaps even some of the scriptures I'll discuss may not be universally agreed to with the brethren. But uh, hopefully it'll give you some ideas <laughs> and some uh, things to talk about when people bring up this subject. We all remember just a few years ago, uh, even if you didn't like President Trump, many of you, August 13th of 2020, the Abrahamic Accords emerged. And we've heard a number of brethren talking about the Abrahamic Accords and what they did. Uh, these five countries <laughs> at the time signed on to the Accord along uh, with some others that were on the sidelines waiting, but agreed to start communications along the line with Israel. It was a major step forward in what's been a long battle. And unfortunately, here we are in 2023. We don't always remember, and those especially in, our, in the newer generation, don't remember the struggles that have gone on uh, in Israel. And part of my thought is, why now? Uh, why should we reconsider what has gone on there now? Of course, the question on everyone's mind is the attack on Israel of Hamas. And when we think about why did Hamas choose now to attack Israel, this is one of the best analysis I've found. Uh, and for those that can't read it as fast, this is from Stephen Cook, a senior fellow on the Council of Foreign Relations, said Hamas believes that the normalization of relations between Israel and the surrounding Arab nations and the integration of Israel into the region is a significant threat because now they've grown, those countries have grown tired of surrendering their interests to the cause of the Palestinians. And so this seems to be a good time for them. And I think this has festered for quite a while. As I say, since 2020, there's no indication that this just became something that Hamas decided to do at the last moment. Perhaps the time picked, but as it says here, Hamas is counting on the fact that uh, they can draw Israel into the quagmire, much like when it invaded Lebanon in 1982, and it took 20 years to get out. So I think that's uh, one of the reasons why now we had that, besides, I think you've seen some uh, thoughts about uh, the time frame for this being consistent with some of the prophecies we've had. Let's look at the promise that was given to Abraham in Genesis 12, 7. It says, Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the Oak of Morah. Now the Canaanite was then in the land. The Lord, or Jehovah, appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. So even though the Canaanites occupied that land at the time, God had set aside that. And we'll talk more about that, the reason for that, and why I think it came at the time it did. But that land was promised to Abram and his descendants. In Genesis 28, 14, it was repeated, and he said, to Abraham, your descendants, to Abram, will also be like the dust of the earth. You will spread out to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south, and in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, it's certainly true that we have the whole Middle East full of descendants of Abraham. So we can see how this has been fulfilled even our day of Abraham's descendants. But there was an important fact in what God told Abraham. When he made the covenant with them, he reestablished that covenant three times in Scripture. 
because we do have a problem today. Abraham is claimed to be the father of both the Jewish people through Isaac and the Arab people through Ishmael. And it is true. He was the father of both of them. But scripture in Genesis 17, 18, 21 specifically dictates that that covenant that was made with Abraham would be reestablished only with Isaac, not with Ishmael. Here he told uh, Abraham and Sarah, my covenant will I establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. And then that was passed on to Jacob, not Esau, who became father of the Edomites. We often talk as Bible students about uh, types of covenants calling this one a unilateral covenant, meaning that it was only on God's part, Abram and Abraham, as he became known, had to do nothing. It was not conditional, as was the covenant that God made with Moses and the people coming out of Egypt. So this was a promise that was to be forever with Abram, unconditional promise that through Isaac, uh, that covenant would be established, and part of that would be the land would be given to them. <clears throat> the historical or origin of the Arabs has always been kind of debatable. There's nothing in the scriptures itself that indicates Ishmael was the forefather of what we have today, uh, what we call today the Arabs. Uh, it was later used, the term Ishmael, or the name Ishmael was used later as kind of a common noun to describe all the desert tribes in general, like the Midianites whom Moses encountered with his father-in-law Jethro. And the lineage of the group was descended really from Keturah. When we see there in Midian, it says the group descended from Keturah, she bore to Abraham Zimram, Jokshan, Medan, and Midian, Ishbek, and Shua. That's Genesis 25, too. So there was a mix here, certainly. In Judges 8, 24, we had Gideon say, I would desire a request for you that you would give me every man the earrings of a spoil. And a footnote is there in parentheses that says, for they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And then the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along the valley like grasshoppers, their camels without number, sand by the seaside for multitude. In Judges 7.24. So we see the scripture sort of gives us a mixed picture of what today we would consider the Arab nations. As we look at the map today of the Middle East, we have 23 countries that would be kind of considered in this venue of uh, the descendants of Abraham here. Uh, and as you see, Israel in the middle is a very small part of all these countries, but it is one of the most populous regions of the world. So we could say in many ways, the descendants of Abraham have done exactly what was said. They've spread to the west, to the east, to the south, to the north. But the important thing is that the land that has become Israel was promised only to Abraham's seed, Isaac. As we look at Israel compared to her neighbors, uh, this is the most recent information. We have 2023. You can see the huge population uh, amongst this group. But with Israel, Israel's ranked number 98 in the list of countries as far as population goes. But note now there are about 9.2 million in Israel, which is about 0.11% of the world population. And certainly the land in square miles, which includes everything in that area of Israel, is less than a half percent of the world's inhabitable land. So I think we all understand and we've all agreed that this, any argument that's there around Israel is not about land. It may be on a small scale, but it's certainly not contingent on what they have. Well, let's go back in history a little bit. How did Jerusalem, 
how did Jerusalem become so important? Uh, Aranua was a Jebusite who owned the threshing floor on Mount Moriah. And God was angry with both Israel and King David at the time, as we go forward, who imposed a census on Israel. The reason he imposed that census was to see whether or not uh, he had enough people to go into battle. Now, Jehovah regarded that action as a sin because he said that he would always be with him. And as a punishment, in that as David was getting ready to fight, God sent him a choice. Wouldn't you like to have a choice? It's sort of like uh, three stooges, I remember. Would you rather have your head chopped off or would you rather be burned at the stake? Uh, well, David had a choice here. He could get three years of famine. He could have three months of fleeing from an invader, or could, he could have three days of plague brought on by the angel of the Lord. And again, this threshing floor of Aranu is where we have Jerusalem today. Well, which one did David pick? David chose door number three, uh, the plague. Why did he do that? Well, I think he counted on God's mercy. Uh, it's a good lesson for us when you're faced with some things that aren't always good. Uh, we look at one that requires mercy, uh, and especially from God, it was a good lesson that David sought uh, to plead with God for mercy. Anyways, that was the plague that would come on three days. So an angel was sent to spread this plague throughout the land. When the angel reached this area, which is called Aranua's uh, threshing floor, God ordered that angel to stop. Interesting point. Angel would stop because I think God had already designated this was going to be a place for himself. God instructed David instead of bringing the plague now to build an altar on that threshing floor of Aaronus. So David bought the location from him for a fair price, even though uh, Aruna said it would be free. I'll give it to you. You're going to use it for the Lord. But David said, no, I will not use anything that doesn't cost me something. So David purchased this location for a fair price to build this altar to God. And eventually, that's what became the site of what we see in the back of Jerusalem and Solomon's temple. So the history is there, we can find in the scriptures, that this Jebusite city and this Jebusite territory, David bought for the use of himself. It said, David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. There he built an altar offered burnt offerings, peace offerings. Jehovah was entreated for the land and the plague was stayed from Israel. So David learned his lesson, pleaded for God's mercy, and he did receive God's mercy. Well, now this place that we see has become the most contested place on the face of the earth. Uh, Interestingly, in Ezekiel 5, we read God's words around this place. This is Jerusalem. I have set her in the midst of the nations and countries around about her. We certainly saw that on the map. And uh, the interesting question becomes, why was it that the Muslims now and why those in Islam want Jerusalem. If we look at the Quran, it doesn't even mention the Quran by name, or it doesn't even mention Jerusalem by name. Muhammad, who is their prophet, is buried at Medina in Saudi Arabia. In the military conquest in 637 and 38 AD, uh, they defeated both Christianity and Judaism there in there is a belief that Allah handed this over to them at that point. But then they lost it to the Crusaders in 1099. That was a humiliation. It's just like the last week to them. And you'll see them still talk as though 
that was a devastating blow that that land still belonged to them from their military quest in 637. As we saw, Israel's land is insignificant. But when it says that they were surrounded in the center of the nations, the Middle East, the terms we use, suggests that it's the very geographical heart of the planet. And here's a sketch that was drawn in 1581. Perhaps I think many of you have seen it. Uh, it depicts the earth as kind of a three-leaf clover, as you see here. And each leaf is a continent, Europe, Asia, Africa. Drawing those three together and connecting a ring and circling a single city, well, that city is Jerusalem. So when we think about that statement that they would be in the midst of the nations, it's certainly true. It's the center of the geographical picture we have uh, in the earth from times immortal. We have three faiths that regard Jerusalem as the center and as sacred Christians. Two billion from virtually every nation on earth. Muslims, 1.8 billion. They're a majority in 49 countries. The Jews, 14.7 million now, six and a half million in Israel, and 5.7 million in the US. When you think about the population of Earth being 7.8 billion, that was 2020, now we're up to 9 billion. Jerusalem is sacred to almost half the population of Earth. No wonder this is a lightning rod for the rest of the world. Let's look at some of the history of Israel as we build up to this idea of whose land is it anyway. 1948 was an extremely significant year, as we know, for Israel. Uh, now, the Arab Muslims that are there call Israel's reappearance into this land from, especially in 1948 as a nation, as the catastrophe. Most of the holy sites, when we go to Israel are still in the hands of Islam. Uh, Rachel and Hebron, the tomb of the patriarchs, Joseph tomb and Nablus, Harim al Sharif, the noble sanctuary, all those still remain in the hands, at least directly, of Islam. Of course, we know the 1967 Six Day War proved to be a fateful war for Israel when they. Uh, regained especially parts of Jerusalem that they had not had before. 1973, the Arabs launched the attack, remember, on the Yom Kippur War to retrieve East Jerusalem that had been taken just those seven, six years before. Many don't realize it, but uh, this is a pretty good book that summarizes what happened during that period of time and provides idea and provides evidence that there was full Soviet backing for that attack on Israel in 73. And if you read the history, it became very close to succeeding in taking it. But Israel's rumored nuclear arsenal is what finally stopped the Kremlin. Now, I'm not sure it would today, and we've seen evidence in the Soviet war with Ukraine. Uh, maybe it would be different, who knows. It was U.S. President Richard Nixon that reversed kind of the passive stance that the U.S. had always had about Israel since 1948. Other than Harry Truman sending a note to Israel, there wasn't a lot of support uh, about Israel becoming a nation at 48 from the U.S. side. But he resupplied the Jewish state of Israel after these battles. Israel became victorious in this war, but it was certainly bruised as it came out of the 73 period of time. On the other hand, the desire to gain this East Jerusalem for Allah has never disappeared. Back in 1978, Anwar Sadat at Camp David uh, demanded negotiation for what he called occupied East Jerusalem. Now, that was never resolved since 1978, never resolved. But Sadat signed the deal if there was a promise to deal with this issue in the future. 
Uh, so my point in going back in the history is to show that this is not something new. This battle has been going on and the generation currently doesn't remember the historical things that went on with Israel. And that's why uh, so much is done to try to eradicate the history. The 1979 Iran hostage crisis blew out any kind of things around this. Interestingly enough, in Iran, which we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, is what caused this uh, to be put on the back table. And of course, many of us that lived through this period of time remember well the one year of uh, the Iran hostage crisis when so much took place and the demand came in resolved by the death of the Shah. 15 years later, we jump ahead with Bill Clinton as the US president, 1993. On the White House lawn, Itzik Rabin signed the preliminary peace accord with who was then Yasser Arafat, who was head of the Palestinian Authority at that time, to negotiate a final status of Jerusalem. But seven years later, the Oslo Agreement uh, was failed to satisfy them again. The Oslo Accords in 1993 provided an interim agreement, a transitional period, and it allowed the Palestinians to have self-government and to have elections. But the uh, immediate authority was given to the Palestinian officials in the major economic and social areas of government. The Palestinian Authority was obligated to create a strong police force, and Israel was allowed to defend its overall security. In 1996, more than 95% of those Palestinian Arabs that were here, that were living there under the control and governance of the Palestinian Authority, they had that authority. Camp David, again, saw U.S. President Clinton trying to, what he called, resolve the issues. But again, it broke down over Jerusalem. Uh, Arafat, who was the new leader, wanted complete sovereignty over the Temple Mount. If I don't get that, it's no deal. At the time, Prime Minister Ehud Barak offered everything but full sovereignty, including hands-on control of the site. So one note important that Arabs have always run the things on the mountain during Israel's rule of the old city, but they don't control the access gates. Israel and the Jews have the right to go up there. Well, let's jump forward to our more modern day, even though this is 23 years ago. The uprising that first occurred in 2000 began a new era of fight that continues to this very day with Hamas. Arafat began a series of intifadas and said that violence would stop only when Jerusalem became the capital of an independent state. But he died four years later. 2006, Hamas took over the leadership with a leader called Mahmoud Abbas. So in those 2006 elections, they became uh, privy to this territory. In 2012, remember the United Nations voted to recognize Palestine, what they called Palestine, as a non-member of the UN, but as an observing state. And these became what we have here today in the red, the disputed territories, which is what is still said. But remember, all the way back to 2000. In 2005, the first significant thing happened with Israel that led up to where we are today. Israel exchanged what is their promised land for what they thought would be peace. That area of Gaza and the area, those areas within what is called the West Bank, what we would know as Samaria. These are pictures from that day. All the Jewish settlements were disbanded. They were kicked out. They destroyed even the homes of the Jewish settlers, because they abandoned those areas to give them to those that were, uh, those Palestinians that were there. 
And this 2005 in August began these transformational events when Israel handed over all this to the Palestinians. It's the first country, first country in modern history to give up land that was acquired in a defensive war, which was the 1967 attack. So this is not, again, so much about land. But let's look what happened there. What led up to today? In that evacuation of Gaza and the West Bank or Samaria, 100% of the Gaza Strip that you see there on the west side was evacuated. Four Israeli settlements were uprooted in, the, in what is called the West Bank there. 21 Israeli settlements were uprooted in Gaza. 9,000 Israelis, 1,700 Israeli families, 38 synagogues in Gaza were dismantled. 5,000 school-aged children gone. 42 daycare centers were closed. 36 kindergartens, seven elementary schools, three high schools, all to turn this over to those in Gaza. And let's just look at two settlements in tri or this part of in uh, Gaza, the Gush Katif settlement, which you see there on the coast. That was the second largest dairy farm in Israel. 60% of all the herbs that were exported from Israel were grown there. $120 million US dollars worth of flowers were exported annually. 10,000 workers were suddenly unemployed. As they, as they were removed from this area. That entire Gaza area, 60% of Israel's cherry tomato exports came out of there. 1,000 acres of greenhouses were abandoned. 70% of all the organic produce that was made was lost. So it was very significant in this area. And it was a huge concession on Israel's part to gain peace. Well, today, as we look at it, should they have done that? That's many of the questions being asked. My contention and amongst some of the brethren is no. Uh, Exodus 23, 31 to 33, when God gave, Jehovah gave this land to Abraham, he fixed the boundary from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines, from the wilderness to the river Euphrates. Now, uh, you see on the left here, uh, in Deuteronomy 7, 1 to 3, what this looked like at the time when they would come into the land and those that are that were living there. I'm going to try to get rid of this on top. Sorry for that popping up. Uh, that was the nations of Canaan before the Israelites came in. And so you see then at the, on the right side, you see the maximum extent of Israel under Solomon. Uh, those that were conquered are in kind of the, the yellow, the vassal kingdoms in gray, and the allied kingdoms in green. But importantly, uh, Solomon's kingdom never went up that far. As you see there with the green and the yellow was the extent of Solomon's kingdom. But it appears that there is a significant more amount of land that Israel was to gain as part of this. The other part I have underlined here in this Exodus 23 is a statement, you shall make no covenant with them, people in the land or with their gods. They shall not live in your land. It's unfortunate that today Israel is paying the price for this position of allowing those who are not to have part of the land to be there. And some of that has severely hurt them. So let's jump forward. August 1st, 1914. Uh, a fight began at that time, continuing to this day, uh, some of what I've mentioned. This is General Allenby. The war was beginning. Leading Jews were pressing their interests to go back, as we know what happened if you've seen the movie, <laughs> any of the movies, but the Jews were pressing a lot of the interests in Palestine. Turkey at that time, recall, was in control, the Ottoman Empire, and they needed to be expelled. 
1917, Allenby was the one that drove out the Turks, and he possessed Jerusalem. One month prior to that, the British had signed the Belfort Declaration at the League of Nations, which would reestablish Palestine for the Jews once Allenby drove them out. Why did Balfour sign a declaration at the League of Nations that would give Israel this territory? There was a person, uh, Lord Curzon. Lord Curzon was a representative from Great Britain. He opposed, actually, the Jewish reestablishment of what be, would become Israel or Palestine. And he was to be the one that was to go and he was, had planned to not sign this agreement that would give the Jewish interests the right to go back and to reestablish uh, their uh, their establishment from you know 1917 onward. Just prior to the vote, the League of Nations, he became violently ill, and so he was replaced by Balfour. Now Balfour had been the sponsor of that original declaration, thus the name was the Balfour Declaration. Well, Balfour took his place and the confirmation passed. Britain was appointed administrator of Palestine. And so it given the right for the Jews to reestablish themselves there. In November 29th, 1947, we had another significant event. You all remember Theodore Herzl, who had begun the move to go back to Palestine and the first significant Israeli to do that. The United Nations had partitioned the land of Palestine into two states in 1947. Uh, the British evacuation on May 14, 1948, led the acting Israeli government to declare independence. 2,500 years after it had been totally destroyed by the Babylonians. And this shows you the partition, which unfortunately was rejected by the Arab state. The declaration initiated a period of trouble that started what we have today, well, started, at least modernly started, what we have today that has continued. Ben-Gurion in 1948, at midnight, May 14th, uh, when that British rule over Palestine formally ended on the Jewish Sabbath, he read the Declaration of Independence. He, at the time, was head of the Provisional Government of Israel and read that aloud on a radio broadcast two hours just prior to the beginning of the Sabbath. Israel would become an independent state at one second after midnight. For Bible students, there's an interesting historical element in this. That first Zionist Congress in Basel, Switzerland in 1897 that came out of Herzl uh, would significantly change the profile of those who were to inherit the land of Israel. Remember, one third of the world's population of Jews had been annihilated during Nazi Germany. But 600,000 that now populated Israel were ready to stand as a nation on their own. 1897, that, uh, think about that. That was only 38 years in 1948 since Pastor Russell had, as the International Bible Students Association, had urged the Jewish leaders gathered in New York City at what was the Hippodrome now Madison Square Garden, to return to the land promised to the heirs of Abraham. They had been seeking perhaps a place in Africa. And he urged them not to do that, to wait, that God would bring to them that land. And sure enough, we had that happen some 38 years later. So let's jump to the modern era. 1948, there were the Arab refugees that were encouraged to leave Israel were not kicked out by the Jews, but they were encouraged by the Arab leaders. They said, we'll purge this land of the Jews. 68% of them left, never saw an Israeli soldier. The Jewish refugees 
were forced to move out of the Arab lands. Uh, pogroms, persecution, brutality that existed made them go back to Israel. If we look at the combined land holding that was lost by the Jews that were fleeing Arab lands, it's equal to or greater than the area of the whole state of Israel. The number of Arab refugees that left Israel in 1948, 630,000. Significantly, the number of Jews that were forced to leave Arab lands, 630,000. Divine providence, perhaps. Since the Jewish conquest in the 13th century BC, or the conquest over them, the Jews have had dominion for a thousand years with a continuous presence for the past 3,300 years. The only dominion that the Arabs had over this land was that conquest that lasted about 22 years. Let's look at prophetically where this stands. Jeremiah 23, 7 prophesied a regathering of Israel in our day that would be more notable than when Moses led the children out of Egypt. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, The Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth, which brought up, which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country and from all the countries whither I had driven them and they shall dwell in their own land. Now, those of you who have studied Exodus have probably talked about how many were in, uh, came out of Exodus, and I think uh, most agree it's perhaps at the top about 2 million. So when we think about the fact that now we have over 6 million regathered in Israel, you can see that this is exactly a, a, a fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy. Jewish population in Israel has grown from that 600,000 back in uh, 1948, which was 82% population, to about 7.2 million today. Uh, that's 75% of the 9.6 million population today. Since 2006, first time since 135 AD when uh, they were when Israel was destroyed and the name Palestinia was given to it by the Romans. There are more Jews in Israel today than there are in any other country in the world. If we look at September data this year, 15.7 million estimated Jewish people in the world, 46% of those reside in Israel. We would certainly say the Lord is fulfilling his promise. I wanted to give you uh, an interesting viewpoint from something Pastor Russell wrote in volume four, page 625, regarding the regathering. He said, well, Israelites in various stages of unbelief will be gathered back to Israel under divine favor, according to promise, yet none shall be in any degree reckoned as a part or even as supporters of or associated with the earthly phase of the kingdom except as they shall first recognize Christ Jesus as the Son of God, the only Redeemer and Deliverer for Israel and the world. So when many talk about today, well, Israel is not religious. Uh, a Gallup survey that was done back in 2015 said 65% of Israelis say they're either not religious or convinced atheists. 30% say they are religious. Now, Israel is right in the middle of what would be considered relig a religiosity scale uh, between Thailand, which is the most religious, and China, the least. So it doesn't matter that the Israelis today, Israel today, isn't full of those that believe. That time comes later, we believe. And I think the statement from Pastor Russell is important for us to take, that they're going to be gathered in various stages of unbelief, and it will be when the Lord moves, that we will find those that are in belief there at the time when God will deliver them and they will recognize him and their Messiah. So where do we go from here? I'm just calling this a 
possible scenario beginning. And I know not all these scriptures are agreed upon by all the brethren. I recognize that. But I did want to present this idea. Three scriptures I look at uh, as it relates to Israel Arab war or what we're seeing today that's continued really since 48. Uh, they shall fly down, Isaiah eleven fourteen. they shall fly down upon the shoulder of the Philistines on the west. Together they shall despoil the children of the east. They shall put forth their hand upon Edom and Moab, and the children of Ammon shall obey them. Some brethren feel this has already been fulfilled. The second one, Zephaniah 2, 4 to 5. For Gaza shall be forsaken, Ashkelon. A desolation, remember, that was one of the major cities that was there with the Philistines. They shall drive out Ashdod at noonday, and Ekron shall be rooted up. Woe unto the inhabitants of the seacoast, the nation of the Cherethites. The word of Jehovah is against you, O Canaan, the land of the Philistines. I will destroy thee, that there should be no inhabitant. Again, a promise that all those that are part of what that promised land would be driven out. And the last one, Obadiah 18 to 20. The house of Jacob shall be a fire, the house of Joseph a flame, the house of Esau for stubble, and they shall burn among them and devour them. And there shall not be any remaining to the house of Esau, for Jehovah has spoken it. The promise to Isaac is an important one to remember. In Psalm 83, we have, of course, the opposition to Israel. Uh, We have opposition to Israel. And uh, some of this, of course, we have several mentioned here. We have the tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gebel, Ammon, and Amalek. All those are descended from Shem. They are, yes, part of those that are uh, part of this uh, Semitic tribe, not all from Abraham, but certainly from Shem. Philistia with the dwellers of Tyre, uh, Genesis 10, 14, descended from Ham, descended from Japheth. All of those are represented in this Genesis 10. But the point I wanted to make in uh, the sixth verse, we have Assyria too has joined them has become an arm for the sons of Lot. Now, why are the sons of Lot mentioned separately? What was the Moabites and the Ammonites, remember, that tried to prevent Ezra from rebuilding the temple uh, in Jerusalem, and they gave them a lot of trouble. They were joined by Assyria. Uh, and I think Assyria, certainly, we would say today, Assyria is, as I think, is Iran. And Assyria, the Persian Empire that we see, that whole nation, Iran wants to restore that. They want to restore that and certainly has been, played a major role in this whole element of uh, the contention for that land of Israel. I'm not going to go in at this time because we don't have a point, but just the idea that Assyria is mentioned in this opposition along with all those that were part of uh not just the descending from Abraham, but all those that were elements of this Middle East. Certainly, Iran plays a big role in that. We're hearing that about that uh, each and every day. Well, let's conclude, brethren. Uh, it's been a lot of information. It wasn't my intent to get prophetically into so much as just to remind us of the history behind here that what we're seeing today is nothing new. It's a continuing element as long as Israel does not have that land that they are promised. And we can continue that fight with respites in between. But we are urged in Psalm 122, 6 to 9, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Peace be within thy walls. Prosperity within thy palaces. For my brethren and companions' sake, I will now say peace be with thee. Because of the house of the Lord, our God, I will seek thy good. So may this lesson in some of the history behind what we're seeing today be of benefit as we consider 
and pray for those who are going through such difficult times. And as we see the fulfillment of God's promises and the elements right before our eyes, to God be the glory forever and ever. Amen.